Hello, my name is Jessica Putman and I am the student coordinator for the Roxborough Roundtables. I would like to welcome everyone to the tables. Today our topic is guns on campus, should security, students, or faculty be armed? And our host today will be Professor Barbara Kimmelman. Hi, I'm Barbara Kimmelman. I'm a professor in the College of Science, Health, and Liberal Arts, a professor of history, and I have been teaching for the past year the Debating U.S. Issues class, and one of the issues we discussed were, were Second Amendment rights and whether students who are uh, legally licensed to carry guns on campus should be allowed to do that. Uh, before we get into the background that I'm going to give and the discussion, I'm going to ask everyone to on the panel to introduce themselves, beginning with the person to my right. Hi, I'm Alex Moreno, and I'm a freshman in industrial design. Uh, my name is Hillel Levinson. I'm an adjunct professor at Philadelphia University teaching international law. Uh, just to give you an idea of my background is uh, many, many, many years ago, I was managing director of the city of Philadelphia. And under the city charter, uh, there are 10 operating departments that are overseen by the managing director's office. One of them is the police department. And uh, under the city charter, the managing director, with the approval of the mayor, has the right to appoint the commissioner of the police department and the commissioner of the other nine departments also. Um, so obviously during that eight year period that I was managing director, I had uh, uh, quite a number of experiences uh, with the police department, with their involvement, with being armed, uh, not being armed, what, what that kind of a situation was. In addition to which, uh, during that time, in which I have maintained to this day, does anyone know what this document is? It's a license to carry. License to carry. Well, it's more than that. It's a license to carry a concealed weapon, which is a whole different thing than just a license to carry. Uh, because People argue about that, whether people have the right to carry a weapon unconcealed, in other words, open to everybody. This is the right to carry one concealed. And I guess one of the questions I would love to hear discussed today is, as a professor on campus, with my appropriate uh, permit, should I be allowed to carry a gun on campus into my classroom uh, concealed so that the class either knows or does not know that I have that. That's my introduction. Hi, uh, I'm Dylan Gormley. I'm a Law and Society major at Philadelphia University. I'm Jeff Baird. I'm the Director of Safety and Security and an adjunct faculty member in the Law and Society program, teaching law enforcement. I'm Mark Gavoni. I'm the Dean of Students at uh, Philadelphia University. It's the fifth college that I've been a Dean of Students, all private schools. It was in Minnesota when Governor Ventura helped pass a uh, campus weapons policy. Uh, so I have some experience there, and I was also a dean of students in Virginia during the Virginia Tech uh, catastrophe. I'm also the Title IX coordinator here at the university, which covers uh, issues related to sexual assault and harassment. And I've noticed recently that there is some legislative effort at pushing forward the uh, conceal and carry laws relative to the latest publicity around sexual assaults on campus. Uh, Jake New Lawrence South Major, freshman Chinese national from a country with very strict laws regarding guns policy. Uh, Matthew Lin, uh, I'm a freshman uh, physician assistant major and uh, I was in Professor Kimmelman's debating US issues last semester uh, when we discussed the, the same topic. And I had to bring it full circle. You started by saying that to your right, um, Jeff Camardi to your left. Mm -hmm. Not politically, but uh, <laughs> probably not. <laughs> uh, I am the vice president and chief operating officer of the uh, university, so I'm like Professor Levinson. Not, not the uh, scale of managing director of the city of Philadelphia, but uh, <laughs> same, same, same occupation here at campus. Um, this is Barbara Kimmelman again. <coughs> When we, when I decided to choose topics for the Debating U.S. Issues class, I felt that um, a wonderful starting point for a lot of issues that are being currently debated would be the United States Constitution. Um, because if you 
listen to debates on the radio and on television, there's a lot of constitution throwing. People will cite the constitution, they'll quote the constitution, and they'll get a lot wrong while they're doing that. Uh, we read a survey from my class that showed that a lot of people think there is language in the constitution that isn't there. For example, from each according to their abilities to each according to their needs, something like 38% or more than 50% was it? of the United States population thought that this quotation from Karl Marx's Communist Manifesto was actually in our Constitution, because it sounds really nice and really reasonable. So it wouldn't, why wouldn't it be in our Constitution? So I thought that I'd make my students uh, part of the 100th of 1% <laughs> of American citizens who've actually read the Constitution, and we looked at the Second Amendment, which reads, it's probably, it might be the shortest of the amendments in the Bill of Rights, at least. A well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. Very short, rather unclear <laughs> in some ways, very controversial. Um, many people who are very active supporters of gun rights really focus on the very last clause, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. They argue that this is clear, this is absolutely no question, this is what it means, right? This is what it means, it shall not be infringed. If you take that quite literally, then clearly it should not be infringed on a college campus either. Other people, and this, is, this has been an historical argument going on practically since the amendment was written and adopted, a well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state, so that's the opening clause, therefore, whatever, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. So because a militia, which is actually an informal, it's not the national military body, right? Members of the state's militias were expected to know how to use a weapon and bring their own weapons to training and to combat if they were called to do so. Many people have read this historically as, well, we may need to get an army up quickly, or the state may need to defend itself for some reason, or, or bring people out in some sort of extreme situation, and, you know, we want those people to bring their guns with them. This is why we want them to be armed. This is why they want, we want them to have those weapons. And this debate, this controversy, has framed so much of gun rights argumentation that it almost appealing to this incredibly short amendment becomes fraught with difficulty because the interpretation of it has been so different. Um, obviously this issue is more than just a general, it's not about gun control, right? It's not a broad gun rights issue, it's very, very specific and obviously pertains to this community. This is a college campus. and. Um, so I just want to begin to invite the panelists to discuss this issue, and I actually think the, the issue of a concealed weapon is precisely what is that issue on college campuses. They're, we're not really talking about allowing people to walk around with a shotgun. The issue is should people who have a license to carry a concealed weapon be allowed to do so? Of course, some arguments uh, are about safety pro and con, right? Uh, people who are pro-safety say we should, people who are pro-safety say we shouldn't. So I just now want to throw it open to the panelists, but to invite the student panelists first to discuss their viewpoints and also some of the broader awareness of what they know about the debate going on in this country at this time. Uh, this is Alex Moreno speaking. Um, um, so when we were doing research for, the, um, for this topic, uh, one of the most interesting things that I found was there's a controversy between um, certain states do have the right to let the people to um, have carry and conceal permits, but the problem was that on public campuses in that state, there, it's technically land owned by the state, and so there was debate on whether or not you could restrict that right to carry concealed weapons on land in the state that allows the um, permit. And because private, it said that private universities had the right to take that away from the students, but it never said whether public university could, because they, they wouldn't define whether it was 
land directly owned by the state or land that was controlled by the university. And that was one of the most interesting topics that I found that I was very intrigued by. Uh, this is uh, Matthew Lynn. Uh, I was also on uh, Alex's debate team when we did this last semester. Um, and I agree with what Alex said. A lot of what he, um, what he researched was very um, interesting in how there's all these different areas where the concealed carry can be restricted or unrestricted, whatever. Um, but one of the things that I found very interesting was how, I guess, how other people perceive this, um, whether they should be allowed to or not, um, kind of ignoring that, just how people react to it. Um, so on the one side of what I researched was uh, people you know, think that a school is a place of education, there's no place for a gun to be. Uh, a lot of arguments said that um, knowing that a professor has a gun on them is something that would distract them um, and like, would be disruptive to the learning environment. However, on the other hand, um, what I personally found the most interesting was that if a lot of people see a college university as a place that's a gun-free zone, that makes it a target. Um, as we've seen in past school shootings, you know, people that are um, or any sh uh, shootings, not just school shootings. Um, we researched one thing about a doctor's office was mm -hmm. uh, gun-free zone. Someone went in there with a gun and uh, unfortunately opened fire. Uh, luckily, someone in there actually had a gun and um, stopped the person. But that was a whole different um, story that I won't get into. Um, but to me, I find it interesting that you know, a college university knows plenty of people living here. We should feel safe. So. Shouldn't that, you know, putting a target on us in a sense isn't exactly something that's safe. Um, and that was one of the topics that interested me in the most, I thought. The issue of a gun free zone is actually, it, it's actually quite relevant, you know, whether we were talking about a hospital, or doctor's office situation, mm -hmm. or a university. Is a university safer as a gun free zone, or is it safer if people who are licensed to carry concealed weapons are doing it, as you said? A doctor had a gun in his office, even though it was a gun-free zone. Got in trouble for it afterwards, but he was able to save someone's life. Another person was killed, but he, he saved, saved, saved other people's lives. lives. Yeah. Other students? Uh, professor, you showed us a concealed carry license. Yes. Are you carrying right now? No. No. And I have never carried it on campus, and would not carry it on campus. I see. No. Um, no. We're a private school. Um, say we were public school, state school, um, and. Our constitutional rights apply, you know, because it's a state school as opposed to private, where private can do as they want, but the state must. Um, would you carry it on? And this is for public, again, not private, because private is different. But if we were at state school, would you be inclined to carry one on you, or would you not? I guess um, I've never thought of it quite that way, but I guess it would depend on. The environment surrounding that uh, school. Penn State, Penn State, out in the Penn State, probably no. No, Temple. Might yes. Yeah. <laughs> 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 I cannot blame you on that, but I think for me, they, um, Matt, Matt and Alex were talking about uh, concealed carries and professors having them. For me, I don't, I don't like the idea. That bothers me greatly, very deeply, actually. <laughs> I don't want to walk into a classroom and have it in the back of my mind that I, I understand that the teaching profession is very difficult and I very stress heavy and I, that doesn't sit well with me being a student. A student who also challenges professors, I, you know, I, that scares me. Um, as far as students go, I think that I, I, I don't like young people carrying weapons, that, I, that, that doesn't sit well with me either. However. For security guards not to be carrying, I think, is absolutely ridiculous. I think that they're our closest thing to law enforcement. They are, and it bothers me when I see security officers that are not carrying weapons, because this is an environment that could potentially be dangerous. But and Alex. Uh, Alex again, but to go off that, that would I, I mean, I don't know specifically the training that these people want to go into, and I hope that it is intensive, but that would add another level of um, training that I would hope that they would have, almost on the level of other police officers. Because well, absolutely, I would, right? I would assume yeah. that if 
Oh, no, I'm not saying just hand someone a gun. Yeah. No, no, no. No. <laughs> no. Thanks for clarifying on that. That was my bad. I... But just so you know, in uh, unfortunately in Pennsylvania, uh, permits to carry concealed are done county by county. Uh-huh. Uh, so, like for instance, my permit is a Philadelphia permit, mm-hmm. uh, and and each county makes its own decisions on what is required in order to is- be issued a permit like this. Mm-hmm. In Philadelphia, it's very stringent. Uh, there is a very exhaustive background check that is done. And you say that that's very stringent here, but in other places it's not is it's it's very lax. You can almost just just mail it in almost. Really? Yeah. Yeah, yeah you so. were hand up first, you want to ask Yeah. Um, I'm Shayla Humber, I'm a sophomore and senior design major. Um, could you go a little bit more in detail the process that you had to go into to to receive the Well, uh, it starts off with a I'm trying to remember now, five, four or five, six page application where you have to fill out history, uh, were you ever arrested, were you, you know, ever convicted of anything, uh, and it goes not only into criminal activity, it goes into civil actions that you may take, and you submit that to the Philadelphia Police Department, and uh, you wait an extensive period of time when they do extensive background checks on you. Uh, where they go into the FBI files, they go into everything to find out if there's anything that you have not disclosed. And the worst thing you can do on that application is not disclose something that that, that is being asked for. Um, after that, you go to, there's a, an office on Spring Garden Street, uh, just east of Broad Street, uh, where you meet with uh, a special members of the Philadelphia Police Department for an extensive interview. Uh, It usually takes at least an hour, if not longer than that. At the same time, you're fingerprinted uh, when you're there and photographed uh, so that you you go through that. Then there's another waiting period because the last thing they want in Philadelphia is someone to be able to get one quickly. Uh, And they want to make you jump through hoops. A lot of people, for instance, don't bother to continue with it because it is so extensive. And, and so they just never go ahead and complete their, their uh, application process. And then, then it is only good for a limited period of time, and you have to renew it and go through that whole... They, they don't give you any benefit from the fact that you've had one for five years. Uh, they, they, you have to go through that whole process all over again. But you go out into some of the other counties, and it is pretty routine where you go in and you give them your name, address, and phone number, and and they issue a permit to carry a concealed weapon. So it, 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 is, it, is, it is very complicated in Pennsylvania. There's not uh, state guidelines as to what every county has to do. Uh, oh, by the way, one of the other things you have to do uh, in order to qua- uh, is to qualify with your weapon. In other words, you, there's a police firing range up in northeast Philadelphia. And you have to go up there and show that you're competent from not only from an accuracy point of view, but also from a safety point of view on how you handle your weapon and under what circumstances. And they quiz you again. Do you know the rules on when you can carry it? Can you carry a loaded under certain circumstances? So it does have to be unloaded. Uh, and, and, and every weapon that you have has to be registered in addition to which, and they have ballistic testing done on every weapon so that if it was ever used, for instance, if someone stole one of my guns uh, and used it in a crime, they would have a ballistic record of, of that. Uh, well, what's the ratio? Do you know the ratio of people who carry firearms in the metropolitan area in Philadelphia who are like licensed? I have no idea. I do not. I, I, my, my guess is, and it's purely a, a, a gut thing, it's, it's a very small percentage because it is so difficult in Pennsylvania. Professor Lane. Just uh, Dylan uh, brought up a very good point. We have Jeff Baer here, who's our vice president who's in charge of something. He'll tell us. <laughs> <laughs> Safety and security. Safety and security. Um, <laughs> do our security guards have guns? 
uh, if not, has a decision made for them not to and why. Um, there hasn't been a, our, our security does not carry guns on campus. That's stated in our Cleary report. It's required to be in there by federal law, and no one is allowed to carry a gun on campus. That's what our position is, which we have to state in that report. That is in there. Why it is something that, as I've talked about with colleagues at different schools, have, as many schools have looked at arming their, whether it's armed campus security or armed police, why they do or don't. Ultimately, two of the most important factors to look at are, do you have a need based on your crimes and do you have an issue with police response? So obviously, based on a history of crimes and then based on police response. Just to give you an idea, I've worked in colleges for 27 years now. The first one I worked at was Bucknell University. When they chose to go armed, people thought, why does this school in the middle of a small town in central Pennsylvania need to be armed? Ultimately, to get an overwhelming number of police officers there to deal with a crisis like Virginia Tech would literally take hours. Um, it made sense for them to have an armed department in that area to be able to assemble officers to protect students. The things that we take for granted is an overwhelming police response and highly trained police professionals, which could be minutes in Philadelphia, responding from a number of areas as well as specialized unit, would, would be ours in that area. So. Those are just saying for an area like Philadelphia. For an area like Lewisburg, to yes, we Philadelphia would assemble at least would, would have an armed response much faster than you would able to put one together. So one of those you know impressions that people have is that it would actually be less needed in rural parts of the state, <coughs> rural parts of the country. But in reality, to assemble police officers to deal with a Virginia Tech type incident. It would actually be much harder to assemble those groups of, of trained professionals. If I could, let me just add, if I may. Um, we're very lucky in Philadelphia in many ways because some of the universities do have armed security people. Uh, right now, uh, at least the last time I checked, there was, uh, in the Philadelphia Police Department, there were 5,500 sworn officers. Now, that may sound like a large number, but it really isn't because you have a lot of sworn officers who are not on street duty. They're at desk duty, they're off it, you know, they're captains and, and, and inspectors and, and, and not available to do that. But the fact that Temple has armed, uh, Penn has, Drexel has, I think those are the three right now that are, 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 are armed. And by the way, their radio systems are all tied into the Philadelphia Police Department radio system. So that if there is a response that, oh, and I'm sorry, I forgot, SEPTA has uh, also armed, armed uh, police officers. And all of them use the Philadelphia facility for their training, the Philadelphia Police Facility for their training. So they all are uh, fairly high level of, of training. So if there is a need for a response in a critical situation, we not only have the police officers, but we also have the, these, these individuals from the, the universities and, and from SEPTA. Uh, whether or not this campus should have armed security, I'm a believer they should be. Uh, I, I think that it, it, can, it can hurt to have that additional backup to a call to the Philadelphia Police Department. I think we're in the 5th Police District, if I'm not mistaken. 39th. 39th? Oh, I'm sorry. Well, it must, okay. fifth Across is, the bridge is the 5th. Okay, all right. <laughs> uh, and, and, and these districts up in this area are, are thinly man, um, man, manned, or women, or whatever. Staff. Staff. Right. Staff. 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 <laughs> uh, and and uh, uh, so I, I, I think it, 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 in an abundance of caution, my recommendation would be that we should look very seriously at the possibility of training and, and having our, our security people armed on campus. The rest of the people, you. for instance, I don't think, I, like I said, somebody asked me if I, I, I've never carried my weapon on campus and would not. I don't believe it is appropriate for a professor to be armed. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I don't think that is, clearly students should not. And guests 
I mean, that's another category that has not been discussed. Um, I mean, when we have... Before, I, I want to look at... We have two people who have made a decision that disagrees with you, and I'd really like to hear... I know, but I want to make absolutely certain, yeah. since we made an effort to yeah. get students here, that yeah. our fourth student makes his contribution before Thank you. we go further. Um, so I think a school, regardless private or public, well, basically you cannot violate the duty as public, the Second Amendment rights to uh, people to carry a gun with them. Uh, however, they are private schools with concern about security forces and have the security level uh, of the area. Uh, a friend of mine who goes to the University of Richmond in Virginia, their school actually have a very well-formed police force. They carry guns and that's direct associate with the local police department. And well, however, yes, that area might be very uh, kind of dangerous. However, compared to us, uh, I believe the statement I just heard so from you, um, you guys evaluated that uh, our school is in a fairly secure position uh, with fast react from the police department if anything actually happens. That, that, is that right? Close to what I said. Okay. Somewhat. So let's give a uh, uh, situation or scenario. What happened if a group of armed force people, bad guys, come to Hayward and then just decide to hold a class in the room with guns threatening give me a billion dollar otherwise I will start to kill the students one by one every one hour. What if that happens? Even police get here, what are they going to get? Negotiator? They're going to have special task force, maybe military. However, the students are already taken hostage. If we have security on campus, that could, that could be prevented. Or or maybe check for people randomly just show up on campus. Because right now we all know that it's an open area. And even people from outside, not students here, they can just show up and wandering around in our school facility, and even though that's trespassing, but what's the chance they're gonna figure that out? Absolutely, they can do that anywhere. They can do that at a hospital. They can go to any environment. So um, we are, you know, we have a history basically of looking at night, not ruling out armed or unarmed security. It's an evaluation from time to time that takes place on campus. And I'm not opposed to continuing that evaluation, but on a what might happen, anything can happen anywhere at any time, whether it's a hospital, a doctor's office, a movie theater. Uh, a college campus, uh, or out on the public street. And those are the things that you measure likelihood, possibilities, and those are the things that are taken into effect. So I right. don't have a, a position for or against, and like you said, I'm always open to the potential for debate and discussion and opinions on the direction that okay. we should go into in the future. Okay, I may add a little more factors in here. Private college, Students, high tuition, people with people with rich parents, provide probably more funds if you hijack here. And if you don't have a well-armed force or a security squad, that make this place a high-value, vulnerable facility. So, actually, uh, theoretically, we have a better chance to uh, be attacked than hospital or other public places. That's how I look at it. Isn't that a fact? So, is, is it maybe we have better uh, prevention to, to, to speak to our, our students here? I'd like to ask our dean of students how wealthy our children's parents are. Fairly speaking, it's our general experience in that question. Fairly speaking. We have a question over there from a student. So. Um, I was just going to say, being a private institution, I just think it's a little odd in a sense, and I guess I never really thought of it up until this point. Um, that we don't have metal detectors and we don't take extra safety precautions on campus coming from a public school in a pretty suburban environment where I feel like I'm generally safe as opposed to this area. Um, we had metal detectors in our school and that's, that's a, just something we had to go through to get to the building every morning, teachers, students, parents, faculty, guests. Um, also, I feel as though the whole idea of having guests on campus, I feel like that's another precaution, that, that precaution is especially taken at that point because even though you know we see these faces on campus every day and the students we don't know um, who else is coming onto our campus and into our residence halls and buildings that are open
open until a certain amount of time of day or night. So I do think that is a safety precaution that should be taken a little bit more um, critically. I just want to say, um, from ex uh, kind of experience, I live in Connecticut, and actually, I don't know how many of you remember, but Newtown, Connecticut, the school shooting, I actually lived 10 minutes away from I'm in town that's over. I was 10 minutes away, so when that happened, my school, high school, we went locked down, the whole town froze and everything. And I just found um, in the coming months after that incident, the type of security that like my school went through, at least the high school, was it was not so much um, metal detectors and um, it, was, it was because the, our campus was very open and how it was set up. We just we they just added more police. Uh, like you know, there'd, there'd be one cop there, and it just show some. It show like a like presence. a presence, yeah. right? And so I think the idea of having a present present presence would would be a much more effective way. Like we have a every uh, every few hours we have a police stand in and do um cross for the crossing guard. Like that is a big at least for me because I'm a freshman and I crossed out already. It is still that is actually a relatively large presence for me to know that there is a cop. There's at least one man who knows, or one man or one woman who know who's very trained and knows how to handle a situation, who to contact and what to do outside of just inside this like in the people that work for the school. I think that is a really effective way. So I'm going to play facilitator for a second if I could. Yeah. Um, you can stay there. All right. Uh, for the students in the research that you did in the professor's class, did you find any information that suggests to you that uh, college campuses or places that have or allow concealed weapons are any safer? Mm. I can say, well, I don't know about necessarily safer, but uh, some of the stuff that we researched um, with uh, like statistics when it showed for um, students that are allowed to con uh, carry concealed weapons, because there are some schools that allow that, um, the statistics have shown that there was no increase in any violence, there was no increase in danger, um, injuries or anything, that it was relatively the same. Um, and, you know, you talk, um, I'm sorry, what was your name again? Levinson. Yeah, well, Levinson. Uh, you talked a lot about, you know, the stringent uh, background checks, all, yes. all the things you have to do to apply for uh, carry concealed um, weapon. Uh, a lot of the stuff that we researched in class and outside of class um, talked about how um, specifically geared towards students, but in general, um, how these people go through a lot of that, and these are people that wish to be law-abiding citizens. They're, if they're going to go through all of this, they're not going to ruin it, and you know, throw all that work away. Just their, their goal is not violence. They're not more prone to violence, and these individuals are not likely to do more dangerous things. If I, if I could actually go back to what Alex was saying about around his hometown where there is an increased presence and it acts more as like a, a deterrent, um, I think my main problem with that is uh, I like the idea of thinking ahead and trying to prevent something from happening. However, if you have a large number of people that can't do anything about it because they're not armed properly, that's when it starts to... I'd rather have fewer people that are better trained and armed properly than having a larger number of security guards that don't have any bangs, as it were. <laughs> um, what, what do you... You were uh, talking about well, actual police. Yeah, see, the, the, the difference between that is that... Um, I'm not saying... I totally I agree with you. Mm -hmm. I think that having some, uh, even a few, just a few people who are extremely well trained mm -hmm. in the area would be very, yeah. very good. But I think because uh, security guards, like you said, if someone just walked on the campus, they don't know whether. Yeah. So because I mean, at the end of the right. day, when you're talking about someone who wants to go do harm to other people, they're they're going to go do it. Right. Like, there's not. There's some things you, you know, just can't stop. Yeah. Exactly. But I think. Um, I guess like a say a saying that I heard that I enjoy is that a lock isn't. For people who want to break in, it's for to keep people honest. Yeah. So the idea of just having, like, even just showing the presence of like someone more official, you, like we could have security guards that are trained that were ex cops that were trained that the same, but showing the idea of just seeing the sight of you know the badge and the colors, like even if you had one and then yeah. backed up by people who were of the same level, would just be just enough to say, oh, maybe, if someone wanted to come here, say maybe I should move somewhere else. 
Yeah. Maybe somewhere yeah, easier or somewhere. And I'm, I might be playing devil's advocate with myself right now, but um, <laughs> if, uh, say, students were allowed to carry guns, which I'm against, just to be, <laughs> I'm against that. But say we were to carry guns, you hear about all these incidences of guns leading to bad things and, you know, all these in problems. But I think that there's a lot of time that we don't hear about the things that have been stopped because of people being armed and being able to defend themselves. So I kind of wonder where that comes into play, that if students were allowed to carry or professors were to carry, that maybe out of those times we'd be able to prevent something. Uh, I know that Dean Gaboni wants to say something, but I, I, I hope that what I'm about to say is a nice lead-in to what he was going to say, and I'm following up actually on, on Dr. Cromartie's and, and Matt's uh, remarks. The, um, I mean, you, you were asking, are, are they safer places, in a way, because people are allowed to carry? Matt's response, very interestingly, was that the big issue when he was researching it is that people were worried, would they be more dangerous places if people were allowed to carry? And the answer was, no, they weren't more dangerous. They're not necessarily any safer either. And so the point I wanted to make, I'm hoping as a segue to Dean Gavoni, is in general, college campuses are rather safe places. I mean, if we think about places that are dangerous versus places that are not. So when we add more weapons to them, where there are law-abiding citizens and people who are well-trained and know how to use them, it doesn't necessarily increase the danger. Now, I don't know, maybe I said something contentious about college campuses being comparatively safe <laughs> places, um, but you know, I personally have never, I've worked here 26 years and I've never felt threatened once in any way, uh, slightly or, um, you know, yeah, well, maybe by you, but you, I give as good as, as I get in that case. Um, so, I mean, how, how do people feel uh, uh, from the administrative side of campus about the contention that college campuses are comparatively safe places and whether or not faculty and students are allowed to carry concealed weapons wouldn't impact the safety of the university at all? <laughs> 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 Let me say, I'll get to that in a second. Okay. Uh, on the issue of uh, security armed, uh, I've, I've been on only one of the five campuses I worked on were security officers armed, and uh, that was a Quaker school. Which has <laughs> lots of <laughs> there you go. That's amazing. Go figure. The only <laughs> incident I know of where a gun was used was to shoot a skunk in the basement of one of the students. The argument was we had to uh, have our arms, and I don't think every officer was armed. We had armaments in the security office that could be accessed if something bad happened. And the argument was that uh, we had to make the place safe from the external possibilities, which I hear is some of the argument here. Uh, having worked with Jeff here for eight years, he, he's got more experience in, in security, certainly, and also here at Philly U. I think back to that, we're, we're satisfied for the time being, subject to the next conversation, that there's good response time for the police, and that's the most effective way to go about that, rather than Army campus security. But to the issue of our uh, college campuses uh, safe depends on who you listen to. So right now, um, the biggest threat uh, publicly, uh, this has not always been the case, but it is the hottest issue now, is sexual assault, violent, violence against women. Now, this is getting extraordinary play in the media, up to and including uh, an, an article I have in front of me from the New York Times about uh, lawmakers call for guns on college campuses to prevent rape. Um, and I'll tell you, as a Title IX coordinator, someone who's worked over 30 years in, in response to sexual assault on campus, that is a real stretch to think that arming students, women students, could, in any case I've ever known about, prevent a sexual assault. Um, and if you'd like, I could tell you what I, I think are some of the common denominators about that. I don't think bringing guns on campus and putting them in the hands of college students, college professors, is a good idea. Um, so I, I'm not understanding at all how that would make us safer. I think these uh, suggestions are often based on catastrophizing 
the worst case scenario, someone walks into a theater, someone goes to a political rally, someone goes into an elementary school. What if someone, like the doctor's office, had a gun, shoots the guy, saves lives? I think that's undoubtedly a compelling, um, swirling set of arguments and circumstances. But if uh, I do not think that uh, necessarily all college campuses or universities are safer than their local environments, there are lots of volatility in these cultures. Alcohol, drugs, young people, external uh, visitors, friends of friends, drug dealers. Um, pick your campus and there's examples of these types of criminal behaviors. It, it happens that this particular campus isn't a hotbed of criminal activity in my humble estimation. <laughs> you could read the Cleary Report and figure it out for yourself how many crimes we actually report. But I don't think that arming people on this college campus or probably any college campus would have a material impact on making a college or university. Is that the case with students and professors, dear? Both. Paul. And I, what about security? Well, security is a toll. That, that's just a practical, circumstantial decision. Mm -hmm. So let me give me a less than two minutes on that. Why do we have a crossing guard? Because someone was hit riding a bike, going through the crossroads, blasted into kingdom come and grievously injured. She's alive and well, actually, on my Facebook friend page. <laughs> but she was really badly injured, and the, the campus decided at the moment for liability and safety that a crossing guard at very significant cost was a good investment for our students. Why are our residence halls locked? Because we had a stranger rape in the 90s, and many other colleges have had <coughs> as well. And now it's virtually common practice at any college or university to limit access to residence halls by swipe cards, keys, sign-ins, and so on. So this is a dangerous world. Things happen. Bad things happen at certain campuses. Dorm fires, Seton Hall, uh, murders, uh, accidents, and so on. So you'll see in the history of higher ed that colleges have been legislated for by uh, state legislators uh, to protect students. And certainly the Cleary Act, its long history, indicates that there was a time where uh, serious uh, crime was thought to be covered up and the colleges were not as safe as they purported to be. So there's a lot of politics, a lot of circumstance, a lot of risk management. But in the, in the final analysis, I don't think that uh, students or professors or guests should have guns. And on campus here, uh, I think I'm in the conversation, glad to have it. I'm happy with what we're doing now. We don't have guns. I would uh, suggest that we paint that with a broad brush. Temple, I'm sure they had that conversation yeah. a long time ago. They got guns. How many? Who has them? I don't know. Different scenario. Temple, uh, Temple is just police force. Um, the University of Pennsylvania has a police force. They are their own municipal police forces. Um, Drexel is now a municipal police force. They're a step beyond um, beyond armed campus security. Uh, they are, I know, in the case of Penn and Temple, they are in the top ten size-wise of police forces in the state of Pennsylvania. Um, that's that's a whole different um, level. There's really several different levels to look at: armed, unarmed, you know, police, armed security. Those are all the types of things, and I would say right now we are unarmed. Is there a possibility that that's an ongoing conversation? Well, I think security on campus is always an ongoing sorry, conversation. But um, I just want to say they are one of the largest schools, aren't they? they they're size-wise compared to you know, you know, Temple and Penn. They're extremely large schools Penn State compared, to, well. Penn State, compared to ours. So I can see how having their own, almost, almost as if I'm like, their own like section of the police force where they, you know, they can come in and stop by. And can I just make one comment? Uh, if you talk to most police officers in Philadelphia, they'll tell you very clearly that the baddies are not going to do something bad in front of a police officer, an armed police officer. And I think what I hear talking, uh, the theme talking is, is we're talking about prevention now. We're not talking about necessarily rushing in when there's already an incident and, and, and taking over, having taken over a situation. Um, baddies are going to look for the easiest opportunity 
for them to be able to do something bad. A little known event that uh, took place in Philadelphia a number of years ago uh, was there was a big argument about the visibility of police cars. And one of the things that they've done recently, and I don't know if you've noticed it, but you take a look at a police car, a, a, a regular, a white police car, there are the bar lights on the roof, and they have the red and blue light on the end of it, all of them lit now. And the reason was that people complained about the fact that the police car could be two cars away and you would not know that it was there. And one of the reasons there's been a reduction in street crime in the city of Philadelphia is the turning on of those lights. And if people know that our security people are armed, it, it's, it is a deterrent. Uh, I think that is, that, that's been made very clear. Uh, I agree 100% that faculty, students, guests, you know, that's a no-no. Uh, that opens up a whole can of worms that is, that is really a very... But, uh, but I think that the, the whole question of arming our security properly trained with the proper credentials, pro pro proper... And maybe not all of them. Uh, maybe just a select few is something that the university should revisit. And, and because it, it is a deterrent, and it does give some of the baddies second thoughts about coming onto this campus... And, and causing a problem. Hi, it's Jessica. Um, I just want to state that I am against guns on campus, especially for faculty and students. Security guards, I think, is a whole different subject. But going off of the scenario that was presented earlier, my only, like, my biggest fear with people having guns on campus is they will become, like, a vigilante. And in the hold-up situation, and we're being held hostage, and a guy says, I won't hurt no one as long as no one tries to be the hero in the room. That person with the gun decides, oh, I have a gun. I can stop this. The guy turns around for a split second, tries to shoot him, miss. Now the guy's killing people. I'd rather you not try and save me if he says he's not going to kill anyone. <laughs> I don't want the risk of you potentially not killing the person who is attacking us. I'd rather have that safety, like, okay, there's a possibility he will kill us, but then at the same time he said he wouldn't. Please don't try to be the hero. Like, I'm scared. <laughs> okay. Um, okay. So yeah, I, 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 I'm the one who gave the scenario. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> just, just going off. <laughs> okay. Personally, I don't think let students to, regardless of lesson or not, to possess a gun on campus is a good idea. Yeah. So I mean, just come this um, situation we see in different universities, even across the globe, that students have a meltdown because yeah. academics are so hard and stuff like that. Um, so they should really, really should not have a gun. However. When it comes to faculty, I, on second thought, I think if they are qualified and capable of, like the gentleman here who was in charge of the police department, uh, can well handle a gun, meanwhile can protect the safety for the student in, um, in case of any emergency happens. And when it comes to security force, I think they should definitely be armed. Because according to the Second Amendment, uh, regardless how interpreted, basically grants the citizens a right to bear arms. So we don't know that some of the citizens are good, some of the citizens are bad. If you give the guns to the bad people, so you don't, the good people don't have the gun, <laughs> what's going to happen? I, I, I don't want to look further, it just it looks really dangerous to me. So in that case, my position is really clear, student, no, faculty, qualify, yes. <laughs> and security guards, definitely. That's all based on the idea of uh, prevention. And going back to deterrence, I mean, uh, <laughs> I just at the end of the day, if people are going to do something bad, they're going to do something bad. I, I, no matter how many... Maybe not if well, it's like, 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 <laughs> like you said, hold on. It's, it, it's, I'm not 100% pro-gun, I'm not 100% anti-gun, but as a faculty member, I don't want the responsibility. Okay. Of protect, my, protect my, the class. my responsibility <laughs> is to my students to educate my educate the students to the best of my ability. It is I can't think of your Jeff Jeff. It's Jeff's job to protect not only you but me as well. Okay, so we all have our own little responsibility <laughs> on campus. Okay? And yours is to do And where does You're the liability come in? If suddenly they tell me to carry a gun, 
what is the liability? Now suddenly, can I be liable if I'm forced in some situation to shoot someone? It, it just opens up too big a can of worms. Can I, can I mention from, from a training standpoint? standpoint? I think I'm going to say what you were talking From a training about, standpoint right? in Pennsylvania, um, for armed security, it's, uh, it's called Pennsylvania Act 235. It's a certification through the state that you would get with a series of background checks, training, and the right to carry a firearm in your job as, as an Act 235 certified agent. Pennsylvania go through Act 120, which is a much more extensive police training. Despite that, I think one of the things that you were trying to prompt that I shared yesterday, one of the things recently in the Department of Justice report that was issued at Commissioner Ramsey's request for Philadelphia is to have much more extensive training. And in almost 50% of the shootings where police are shooting someone who is unarmed, it's a mistaken perception of a threat. So these are in people that have the highest level of training. Exactly. And those folks are on average about 33 years old or approximately eight to 10 years into their job as a police officer with the training and retraining that they've had, yet in the cases of unarmed people being shot, 50% of the times it was a mistaken perception about a threat. That's that that's a real indication of some training changes that they need to be made that need to be made. I suspect that we're gonna see that statistic possibly pass Philadelphia as the Department of Justice continues to look at police involved shootings around the country. Um, well, Stevie, you had to stand up and then Professor Wilkins. We have five minutes left. I, I just like to say that like you could train the teachers, like carry guns, you could train the officers, the security officers on campus to train guns, but if you're forcing them, how many of them would actually be able to pull the trigger on another person? Exactly. That's why I, when I said, well, the military goes through that in, in in extensively. Like, like in the teacher case, they, the professor case says they it's basically, if they want to do so, they get qualified and they do so. It's not a forced or a required scenario. Yeah, that qualifying with a gun is a big difference than having to actually aim at another human being. Yeah. Well, and yeah, that's why the military so spends countless dollars trying to figure out how we can maximize the best use of our ammunition by firing an aim shot instead of just firing in, in, a, in a spray. Um, so again, it, it puts a whole new responsibility on top of a professor if he has to carry a firearm. And I don't think that the colleges or the university would be willing to pay me enough <laughs> to carry a gun on campus. <laughs> Professor Wilkinson, and then maybe we'll let Matt Lynn get the last word before we close um, down. There's a set of stakeholders who have not yet offered an opinion today, and that's the moms and dads who signed the checks <laughs> and keep this place going. And uh, my question is, what do you think their input in this conversation would be had some representatives been here? Very interesting. Thank you very much for that insight. And we may want to respond. Maybe, Matt, in addition to your observation, you might think about what your parents would uh, think in um, response Well, to first, that. I was going to say uh, to you, um, you're talking about like if the faculty was forced to uh, carry weapons. But what if they chose to on their own, and such a terrible incident were to occur, and they didn't do anything, are they considered liable? That's not a good question. Question. That's a very good uh, question. Because then that puts a whole other mess into it. It does. It puts a whole whole new spin on things. And then again, as you did say, I believe, if they do something, then are they liable for yeah. that? They did, made the wrong decision. And as Jeff just pointed out, 50% of police shootings mm -hmm. are because they misjudge the threat. So then if someone that's not trained as a police officer, they're probably much more likely to miss uh, exactly right. the threat. Do I wrap up? I wrap up. All right, well, first of all, I want to thank all of the panelists, but especially because we love students, our student panelists, for participating and sharing their views, and for our expert panelists for sharing their insights and their experience, and all of the participants and the students who made their contributions. I appreciate it very, very much, and this is obviously a very controversial and um, fascinating 
So thank you for offering me the opportunity to host this um, Foxborough Roundtable.